Hello and welcome to Cranfield University. In this interview series, we explore the role of philosophy and humanities more broadly in management, engineering, but also in our everyday lives. My name is Andrei Pavlov and I'm a professor of strategy and performance at the School of Management. Hello, my name is Toby Thompson. My interest is in continental philosophy, Heidegger and executive education. And our guest today is Dr. William Bullitt, Professor Emeritus of Structural Engineering at Michigan Technological University. Bill, welcome. Welcome to Cranfield. Thanks, Andre and Toby. Thanks for having me. Could I just start uh, by asking a very general question? Um, I know that you've spent um, a lot of years thinking, writing, and talking about the role of philosophy, of engineer, philosophy in engineering. So what is the role of philosophy of engineering? Why should we talk about philosophy uh, in engineering? Well, I think one of the basic reasons is that there's a good argument that engineers should be a little more thoughtful in the sense of thinking about what they do and how they do it. Um, so in one of our papers, we argue that an engineer should be reflective, not necessarily every day of their life, but certainly at the end of a project or the end of a day, stop and think back on what you did and think about, just think about it and see if it all makes sense to you. And so that's not completely philosophy, but the idea that you should do it begins to enter the realm of philosophy. And if you start doing it very much, you begin to wonder, well, why am I doing certain things? Was I, I was taught to do them. Does that make sense? Not necessarily does it make sense from an engineering science standpoint, but just does it make sense from a decision standpoint? So I think philosophy has a, could be a lot of help in getting engineers to think a little bit more about why they do what they do. And Bill, it sounds like engineering and philosophy, not exactly an oxymoron, but I don't conceive of, and maybe the audience watching this video, don't conceive of engineers as being innately philosophical. Am I making a problem there or is there a problem? I don't think they are innately philosophical. And that's one of the reasons that it makes sense to try to bring philosophy into engineering because I think it can help engineers um, be more thoughtful about what they do and how they do it and why they do it. Uh, I, I would argue that there's sort of day-to-day -day engineering, which is what you do every day. You just, you're just designing, you're working with mathematics, you're working with models, you're doing all, you're working with prep codes of practice. You're not really thinking about what, what these things mean. So at some point you really should think about, think a little more deeply about where, why you're using some of these things and where they came from. And although that's not directly related to philosophy, once you start doing that, you find there are schools of philosophy that look a lot like engineering, and that would be pragmatism, for instance. Mm. Can you give us an example where that would be really useful, where that would be really valuable to ask those questions um, as an engineer? Well, if any time you're doing something new, and I buy something new, well, let's back off for just one second. Anything we do in civil engineering or in structural engineering is, an, is, an, is a single entity. We're not making a million or a billion cell phones. We're making one structure. It's referred to as a non-prototypical structure, meaning I can't make a prototype of it. So if I'm doing something like that, I, shouldn't, I should think about other buildings like it or other structures like it. But I shouldn't get hung up on that. I should realize that what I'm doing, what I'm doing might be outside, say I'm using a code of practice, say I'm using the structural concrete code. Maybe what the code has isn't exactly what I should be using. Maybe I should be delving more deeply into that. That would be one example. That's not necessarily philosophical in the sense, that's not necessarily philosophical, except the thinking about it can be. If you just dive in and start using what are referred to, what I refer to as heuristics, without thinking about the limits of those heuristics, you're asking for trouble. Things might happen that you don't expect. So that's a that's not philosophy in the sense, but it's thinking philosophically. And I'll leave it at that. 
Mm. You, you talk about sometimes, and some of the writings that you've done, levels of expertise. I think Dreyfus, Hubert Dreyfus and his, his brother Stuart talk about levels, novice ending up in mastery of a topic, let's say. Are you, what you're saying there about reflective practice, is that something that's really nice to have, but that comes when you're well into your career as an engineer? Or is that something you should do really early on? By the time you're way into your career, you should be really good at it, which means you probably should have started much earlier. <laughs> I would have, I would argue, I do argue that you, some of it should be specifically pointed out in undergraduate education. Not necessarily going to go very deep into it, but um, it, it should be pointed out pretty carefully that codes of practice have limits to them. And that might not be obvious to, uh, probably isn't obvious to undergraduate students first starting to use them. They're just trying to figure out how to use it. But at some point, they're going to have to start thinking that there are limits to what this code can do and what you should be doing with it. And so that would be the first step in thinking about some of these things, just having it pointed out to you. Mm. And I know that in your writing uh, and in your work um, exploring this, um, you have developed the concept of, in, of the engineering way of thinking. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is and where it came from? What's the sort of intellectual provenance of, of this concept? It's an attempt to generalize engineering to in a much more broader way. So I'll actually, or I will, I will, actually, I will state uh, an early definition of it. The engineering way of thinking is a means to approach design in the broadest possible sense of the term, using heuristics in the broadest possible sense of the term, to develop, maintain, and manage artifacts in the broadest possible sense of the term. Um, that phrase in the broadest possible sense of the term comes from Wilfred Sellers, who said the aim of philosophy is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense <laughs> of the term. So that's, an, that, that's one definition of it. And the idea is that design is something that humans have probably done in some way since they first picked up a rock and threw it at an animal or something to that effect, or picked up a stick and used it as a club. Then they weren't engineering, but they first used something and then thought, well, is there a better way? And they started trying new things. So the first step would be this experimentation. That's always part of engineering. And as a matter of fact, some people have taken the phrase, the engineering way of thinking and converted it to the engineering way of thinking and doing. And I tell them that's redundant because part of the thinking engineers do is actually doing things and trying something, seeing if it works. If it doesn't work, try something else. Yeah, there's mathematics involved in modeling, how you're going to make the change, all sorts of other things. The basic idea is very general. So design first is a very general term. Heuristics are a very general term. There's, well, there's human heuristics like confirmation heuristic where I see things that tend to confirm what I believe. And if you do that too much, you get a confirmation bias. Well, in engineering, there's lots of heuristics have to do with um, what's a good way to try the next thing. And if I go outside of that, I get a failure. In engineering, it's not a bias, it's a failure. It might be a minor failure, but it just means I got to try something mm. different. And then artifacts is, like I said, some people even think of the earth as artifacts meaning that humans have manipulated the planet in so many different ways that essentially you can't go anywhere and not find some effect from humanity, which means in a way we've engineered the planet. We might not have done a very good job at it, but we've engineered the planet. So I, this came about over many years, thinking about uncertainty in engineering and what's called structural reliability. And just a lot of thinking about engineering and beginning to realize that it engineers do things in a very in a very general way but they mostly do it with technological systems and it as time wore on it became more apparent that some of those ideas can be expanded into other types of non-technological systems 
economic, economics, economic systems, social systems. And that's where this idea came from. Mm. So using, sorry, I think you're too. I just, yeah, I was just going to say, um, I have so many questions. Yeah, and I, think, I think Toby does as well. <laughs> but before we, before we proceed, actually, uh, can I ask you to, uh, just for our benefit and for the benefit of our audience, just tell us what your definition is of design heuristic and artifact? Because uh, we are talking about this and just for us to understand it. Well, design is basically trying to like to develop something new or to manage something that exists or to maintain something that exists in whatever way you have to do it. That's, that's a very general design. Most people think of design as creation, uh, making something new, making yeah. something that doesn't already exist. And while we're there, that something is an artifact. Whatever you're trying to design is an artifact or whatever you're trying to maintain is an artifact, whether maybe it's a highway system and you're trying to maintain it. The highway system is an artifact. Or you're trying to manage a large business. That business is an artifact by that definition. And then a heuristic is just something that can be used to solve problems that you cannot necessarily solve analytically or that you can find a single solution to. Um, there's a writer named Billy Cohen who wrote a book called Discussion of the Method. His definition, which is actually a pretty good one, a heuristic is anything that provides a plausible aid or direction in the solution of a problem, but is in the final analysis unjustified, incapable of justification, and potentially fallible. Very good. means I'm making a short, I'm taking a shortcut. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let's think turbulence. Turbulence in fluids, whether it be liquids or air, Turbulence can't be modeled perfectly well. It, it's impossible, at least at this point in time, it's not possible. So any type of flow systems that involve turbulence are going to have um, parts of them that are developed from experiments, empirical empirical techniques. And empirical techniques are always, always have limits. Those were developed under, under a certain range of conditions. So anything you get out of that is a heuristic. Uh, Billy Cohen essentially argues that everything is heuristic because they're all just models. Everything's just something you do that's not necessarily guaranteed to work. So a heuristic is is a rule of thumb. The simplest type oh. of heuristics are rule of thumb. Brilliant, thank you. So, <laughs> well, this is great. Um, using Seller's phrase then, humans, all humans, are broadly engineers in the poss broadest possible sense of the term. Uh, every, we're all engineers because we all use heuristics. No. You're all using engineering, but you're not all engineers. Okay. Just like you use mathematics, I assume, but you're not a mathematician. So uh, that's one of the key, I mean, one of the key points I think is that yes, I believe that what you said is true that all humans use engineering. Matter of fact, it's possible chimpanzees even use some and maybe some other creatures, but they're not engineers. They haven't been trained in using this in, in the thinking process that's involved in it. Not that they're not using the thinking process. They simply haven't been trained to use it in a very deep sense. So we're talking about a threshold here beyond which you clearly have passed and beyond which I guess undergraduate students, people going into engineering, uh, wanting to pass or will uh, quite, quite quickly pass. What is that threshold? Um, there's a few of us in our department who've talked about this, this thing that happens to students who make it through engineering. And this thing is they come in and they're, they're like all the other students who come in. And by the time they get out, they're thinking differently. And, you think of, and if you think about it a second, how many people say things like, who aren't engineers, say things like, engineers are weird. Engineers think weird. Engineers Oh, an you're an engineer, you can fix this. Now, why is that? There's some reason for that, for both of those things. And part of the fix things is that, yeah, engineers often can fix something in your house that most people would throw up their hands in despair. They do it by this business of looking at it, thinking about it, trying to figure out how it works, then trying something. So that's the primary distinction. That's why I really 
think that to be defined to an email, I probably get in trouble for this, but to be an engineer defined as an engineer, you need to have an undergraduate education in engineering. If you've skipped the undergraduate one and jumped straight to graduate, well, maybe you maybe you'll have learned it. But a lot of times they're missing some of the this sort of basic way of thinking. They tend to be a lot more theoretical. They've missed this knowing how, this business of hands-on, if you will. I don't exactly know what term to use, but what it boils down to is having a fairly refined way of using heuristics. So is engineering education essentially a systematic way of learning the engineering way of thinking? Um, it's a way of learning the engineering way of thinking. It might not be all that systematic sometimes, but I think Fair it enough. is. That's the effort to be a, have a systematic way. But yes, to learn engineering. The engineering way of thinking is probably a little deeper than most undergraduates get to. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't like the idea at first, so what, particularly so, engineers. So what is it then? Why, what is the difference between how engineering is taught traditionally and what you see as the engineering way of thinking? Um, well, the difference is mainly, or for the most part, the education's aiming to make somebody able to do day-to-day -day engineering and to fit into engi an engineering system, an engineering firm. And, and that's its purpose. It's, it's in many ways training, which I don't think of as bad. And we do have general education. So the idea is to give people a broad range of training, if you will, or a broad range of education, as broad as we can do in four years. Reason is that if you're doing if you're, if you're really going or really thinking about the engineering way of thinking, you have to be very broad. You have to have read a lot and looked at a lot and seen a lot because the idea is you don't know what next, what's going to come up next. You don't know what problem is going to jump out in front of you or be given to you. And some of them are going to be way unusual. And if that's the case, you have to have a you have to work in teams or you have to have, but even there, you have to have a way to think broadly about how you approach whatever problem it is, what kind of heuristics you'll use. And so undergraduate education can't quite do that. And we don't even really try too hard. We say we've got to do general education and engineer, most engineers don't even understand why they have to do that. So as a matter of fact, they don't even like it. But in the long run, if you're, if you're going to start thinking of engineering in a broader sense and able to do more than you normally think of it, you've got to have a broad range of ideas and a broad range of experience. So basically, engineering education is getting you and making you the first step toward the engineering way of thinking. The funny thing is, once you reach that point, you realize that almost everybody thinks like that who's trying to solve problems. They just don't do it the same way as you. So I'm trying to come at this by thinking, what is not an engineer and what is not an engineering way of thinking? And I can't think of what that is. Am I wrong? Well, if you use the word engineer in a very generic sense, like so many people do, then what you're, then you can say that anybody who's do attempting to design something using heuristics is an engineer but i don't think that's necessarily true they're using engineering there's a distinction just like there's a distinction between a mathematician and mathematics there's a distinction between an engineer and engineering so to be an engineer i'm not going to argue you have to be a registered professional engineer or anything like that but you have to have at least well, let's put it this way. You have to, at the bare minimum, you have to have enough education that you're thinking like an engineer. That could be there. Are, or it's possible that physics majors and some others come to that. But more often than not, they tend to be overly theoretical. And it's one of the difficulties with um, engineering education. You really have to have, it's sort of messy to do it right because heuristics are messy and hands-on stuff is messy and the world is messy. And so what we try to do with engineering education is teach them engineering science. And yeah, eventually we'll get to design, senior design project or something. But we tend 
to avoid the messiness. We tend to do the things that are theoretical. Eventually, it'll come through because there's just enough stuff in engineering to get us there. And so unless you've been through that process in some way, you're not an engineer. But you still may be doing engineering. You're probably not doing engineering, but you still may be thinking like an engineer. And as a matter of fact, you might be doing engineering, which could be a potential problem. Yeah, I'm thinking I might be an engineer. I just don't realize I am an engineer. I never thought I no, was. No, you use engineering, but you're not an engineer. So I, I hear you talking about diversity of thought. And I uh, must admit, I love diversity of thought. And I think of a frame, the engineering way of seeing in the world, because you talked about confirmation bias earlier on, uh, as one way of thinking. And it seems, it seems almost contrary to a diversity of thinking. Maybe I'm getting hung up about this notion of thinking. Well, um, if I stick to the ideas of day-to-day -day engineering, as I've called it, or normal engineering, yeah, it's relatively narrow with respect to the rest of the world, except for certain types of engineers, maybe environment, some kinds of environmental engineers. But Once you step outside technological systems, then you realize that there's a lot more going on there. And in order to attempt to design the system, but that, and that could be maintaining it, for instance, but in order to design, you need heuristics, but there really aren't any. Humans haven't really thought a whole lot about how do I design complex systems. They've made them but they haven't necessarily thought too deeply about them. And they're starting to, and particularly complex adaptive systems like social systems. We don't have heuristics for it. We haven't really thought about it in an engineering way and developed these ideas that allow us to say, well, if you're attempting to make this change to the system, or if you want the system to continue in this direction, you need to try this. We've only thought about typically forcing the whole system to go there. That's not what complex adaptive systems do very well. Mm. They just sort of fall apart if you force them. So the diversity of thought question is uh, arises because if you're going to use engineering in a broad, much broader sense, you need a much broader range of ideas about how those types of systems work before you start to fool with them to do something with them, to design them. And could I follow up on this and um, and sort of just get delve even more deeply into uh, into the concept of the engineering way of thinking? Um, so you mentioned uh, you've kind of touched on um, the idea of failure, and you've talked about design. And so, what is the role of design failure, and maybe ignorance also in the in the engineering way of thinking? Well, first off, I would say that. Ignorance just is one other way of producing uncertainty. Certainly ignorance is a potential problem if you're trying to alter something. And then uh, failure, well, first, what? whenever I, I use the word failure, everybody or everybody, the people who are thinking about it tend to think about catastrophic failures. Mm -hmm. They tend to think of something big that can go wrong. So if I talk about a building failure, Almost everybody thinks about a building falling down. But, you know, that's, there's all, failure's a defined term. So if I design a building and it's built, and when people walk on the floors, the floors vibrate so badly that they're not comfortable in the building, the building's a failure. It didn't fall down, but we had a failure. So failure first has to be defined. And if that's the case, then... For, design, for any design you're going to do, you're going to have to have certain failure criteria. You may not know all the possible ways that a complicated structure can fail or a complicated system can fail, but you have a pretty good idea. So if you, like for instance, the floor shouldn't vibrate so much in the building that people are uncomfortable. Um, obviously, the building shouldn't fall down. A tall building, it shouldn't move so much in the wind that water splashes out of the sink or people get seasick. Those are, those are failure criteria. If the building does it, it's failed, at least in that sense. And so 
whenever there's design, no matter what it is, you got to have some way to understand what the failures are. And you want to prevent the serious ones. You want to prevent them all, but you certainly want to prevent the serious ones. And how you do that, well, there's, it depends on the system, of course. So if I'm thinking about a very complex system, it could be all sorts of failures, both local and global. And I'm out to prevent the global ones as much as possible. But I, I might, if I'm messing around much with it, have to tolerate a certain amount of local failures. And I better learn from them. That's the other key thing to failure. Um, it's Petrosky who started, who probably started me thinking along these lines because Petrosky argues that failure is how engineering advances because you don't really learn much from success. Yeah, you learn that that worked so far. Whether it's going to work as long as you want it to or not is up in the air at this point. And so success doesn't tell you all that much, whereas failure tells you exactly what went wrong. Even if you read much pragmatist philosophers, even John Dewey has sentences in places that say exactly the same thing. He realized it back in the early 20th century or mid 20th century, probably. And do you think Can we need a question? Yeah, yes, <laughs> that, that's fantastic. And, and in fact, I'm, I'm thinking, listening to you, I'm thinking, do you think then we or engineers need a a particularly sophisticated way of learning as well, a, 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 or a particularly sophisticated set of learning processes to capture and benefit from this. I'm not sure how you define sophisticated. That always makes me think um, very clean. And I would say that the tech, that, that the learning's got to be a little messy. The learning, mm. sure, we try to keep it clean, but design and some of these things are messy. And so I don't think we'll ever get to the point where, well, unless we design some whole new engineering programs, where four-year engineers can think very deeply about this. They're too busy learning their specialty. They're too busy Ooh. becoming good at what they do. And that's the first step at whatever they do. So that's the first step. You've got to be good at something. In a sense, I've used a mountain climbing analogy that your engineering undergraduate and maybe even a graduate degree is base camp. And from that base camp, you you should move out in other directions. Sure, you'll be doing a lot of work to get wherever you're going, but you should expand out from that base camp to other areas. And as you do that, you'll start to realize that you may start to realize that a lot of them have application to what you already do and you didn't realize it. But the other ones may get you to think in ways that you haven't thought before. Mm. So I don't know how sophisticated that can be. It's maybe at the graduate level, you could start to add sophistication by having some philosophy course of some sort. The issue well, is, I suppose, you, you're gonna, it, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, I suppose it's, maybe it's just my use of the word. And in fact, by sophisticated, I suppose... What I mean is not so much clean and structured as nuanced and contextualized. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's what you have to do. And and one of the issues is, and in my years of arguing that all disciplines at the university should have some engineering in them, in a sense, general education for the non-engineers. But what are you going to teach? Uh, there's no classes. There's nothing that they could take. It would have to be redesigned. And I, and I would seem to think that if I'm going to try to put philosophy in, in a, in a generic sense, philosophy, I'm not going to teach them a whole semester on Heidegger or a whole semester on Wittgenstein. I, I got to figure out some way to teach philosophy in a way, in a sense, that it looks useful. I don't mm. mean that it is obviously useful. I simply mean it that it's a broad range of philosophy. And that could end up trivial. That could end up just an overview of philosophy. And that wouldn't be helpful. So it somehow has to be connected essentially to engineering if you're going to do it to en for engineers Ooh. or managers if you're going to do it for managers. And I don't think those courses, well, I don't know of any of those courses really, they all tend to turn into either just an engineering course or they tend to turn into just a management course or they tend to just be an, a general philosophy course. And they really aren't doing what you just said. 
nuanced approach. Mm. I'm torn between hearing, in my ear at least, Richard Rorty, you talked about pragmatism quite a few times now, as saying truth is what you can get away with. Um, and diversity of thinking and imagination. I haven't heard you use the word imagination. Can there be failures of imagination? You didn't imagine that this is how it could be done. These are all going well, through my heads as you're talking. I'll, I'll pick on the last one first. <laughs> A failure of imagination is basically ignorance. Mm -hmm. You didn't think of it <laughs> or you don't know about it. So I guess if you're going to define, if you want to define that way, you could have a failure of imagination. I would just argue that's a failure in your design process. You missed whatever it was. But if you're doing very, very complicated, complex systems, there's no way that you can't miss something because <clears throat> you can have emergence. Things can emerge that nobody ever thought of before. And you almost can't think of them necessarily. So <clears throat> there's no way, yes, you can have a failure of imagination, but it might simply be because you can't imagine it. Mm. And then, mm. <clears throat> excuse me, I've read some Rorty and I always get troubled by, from an engineering standpoint, truth. I mean, I know what, I, I know what the arguments about it, but to me, if you if you're going to find the analogy in engineering, truth simply means that whatever you made is whole is working right now. It succeeded. It may not succeed forever, but it succeeded. It's, it's doing what enough. you wanted it to do. So, yeah, <laughs> the pragmatists would have thought the same way. If it works, use it. That doesn't mean it's going to work forever. Nor does that mean necessarily that everybody who looks at it says, "Oh yeah, that's working." And eh, not necessarily. There may be people who have a different view of what works mean, mm. whatever that artifact is. Mm. That's interesting. Uh, I, I must yes. admit, I'm also I'm also not um, not a big fan of Rorty, um, but I do like the uh, the classic pragmatists. And um, just wondering, where do you see the biggest resonance between? your way of thinking or the engineering way of thinking and and the ideas of the of the early pragmatists if at all well first one would be um, purse because he clearly thought that all humans were fallible and that no matter what you did there would be things that didn't go the way you expected that you didn't know about and that slowly but surely a community would find something that was right but even then you're fallible. Well, that's that. That's clearly true. We've already, we've already said. I think that engineering, at least engineering in the broad sense, advances by failure. Um, the other pragmatists, well, at least the two other big ones, James and Dewey, were oftentimes berated for this attitude that if it works, use it. I mean, in the sense mm. of being very materialistic and anti-intellectual much too what's that anti-intellectual in yeah anti-intellectual for sure yeah. and engineers get called that all the time so that's a very simple i mean of it you're you're out in engineering and fa and the pragmatists both believed that you're working on, on specific things you're not trying to figure out what's going to happen to the whole world you're trying to figure out what's going to happen to this thing you're working on, whether it be, it would be an artifact in my definition, and in theirs, it would be an idea. And they also were, con were constantly berated for that idea. And engineers Ooh. get the same thing. There's, there's, it's very contextual and there's high level of contingency in whatever you're doing. You're just doing something new. And so you're not going to get it right the first time. You're going to have to work forward. And it, it just, sounds weak and most philosophers want you to think in a much more broad sense and a much more deep fundamental sense but the pragmatists didn't want to do that they didn't think that that's the way you were going to get somewhere in the world and that's engineering so there's there's a lot of connections i've written at least one paper on it and some and mm. included it in some others so dewey certainly Dewey has a 
book called The Quest for Certainty. And if you read that, there's a lot in there that, that, that very directly applies to engineering ideas and engineering way of thinking. So I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You talk, Bill, uh, about engineering judgment. Is what you've just described there, is that engineering judgment? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Um, engineering, I often tell the students when I get them in class, I give them the quote, I don't know, it's attributed to Mark Twain, but I don't know if that's who said it. Good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> so my comment is I'm trying to get as much of the bad judgment out of you here in school as I can, because engineering judgment is just that. It's an ability to have your own innate heuristics that you've developed over the years that allow you to make decisions about engineering projects in a way that people who haven't been where you've been can do it. And even the engineering profession recognizes that. You can't get a professional engineer's license in the vast majority of places, maybe it's everywhere, without three to four years of experience under a licensed engineer. Because they realize that just coming out of school, you don't have the experience necessary. You have some, but you don't have enough. So you need more before you can do that. And then if you want to go farther and design tall buildings, for instance, you're going to have to have a structural engineer's license, which in most states, at least in the U.S., requires that you have a professional engineer's license first. And there's even higher levels of structural engineer's license. So they recognize that experience is a, is a big part, and part of that experience is making mistakes. Um, and, of course, we hope that the system's in place to check everybody's work to make sure that those mistakes get picked up early and not later. So uh, I, go ahead. No, I've also heard you talk about care in terms of, and I thought it was in terms of judgment. Say you more said, about the notion of care. Care. Oh, I thought you said CAD. Sorry. Care. C-A-R-E. C -A -R -E. Yeah, right. Um, there's actually a philosophy of care, which... I don't haven't gotten into too deeply except to write a paper with somebody who was interested in it. And it's mainly the idea of being conscientious and putting value on what you do so that you care about what you're doing. And from an engineering standpoint, it, it means all the things that you can do to increase your judgment to reduce whatever kinds of failures you might be, there might be, recognizing all along that you probably can't avoid all the failures. You're going to make math errors, maybe, or programming errors, or and then that would mean you've got to have essentially some dirty ways to check to see that your answers make sense. You can't always do it, but you can. We force people who use large well, actually, I'll use another example. I, I know an engineer from um, Skidmore Owings in Merrill. They've designed a lot of very tall buildings. And he's a program project manager, so he manages the design of a single tall building. And he has a lot of engineers who do analysis for him. So about once a week, they all come together, and they look at the results of the analyses, and he asks them questions, such as, okay, look at this beam. Does it make sense that under these conditions that beam is in compression? Does it make sense that this column should be doing this when you do that to your building? The whole idea is to make sure there's not something wrong, like you didn't accidentally apply the loads in the wrong direction. And so even extremely complicated analyses, people have to be able to sit down and look at them and say, does that make sense? In, the, in an overall sense, does it make sense that this is happening, whatever this is? And so that's care. And that's not the philosophy of care, but that's where it leads you from an engineering standpoint. It leads mm. you to trying to think in, of things in as many different ways as you can to avoid whatever might happen. Can I just sort of bring us back to the, um, 
to the idea that the engineering way of thinking uh, applies beyond just engineering and could bring the benefit to uh, um, to well could be could bring bigger benefits if it's applied more widely. Um, so what would these benefits be? How would you think individuals and societies benefit if we were to expand this beyond the confines of engineering schools and the engineering profession? Well, first off, let me say that even the committee I'm on, it's all engineers. It took a long time for me to convince most of them that the idea is that engineering could be applied more broadly. Eventually they came around to it, but it takes a while and most people who um, I try to talk this with this about who aren't engineers, I get the business about engineers are weird and engineers have already screwed up the world enough that we don't need more of them. We don't need them in more places. I would argue that, yeah, we screwed up the world, but that's because we didn't do a very good job of engineering, not because we're engineers, not because we tried. Yeah, we screwed, yeah, let's, let's leave it at that. So where else can it help? Well, I kind of doubt it'll ever happen, but um, I think it can help with governmental systems and societal systems. And I'll use, well, it can help because mostly we try to manage those kinds of systems from the top down. We try to tell everybody everywhere, let's just pick the US or maybe you all can think about the United Kingdom. We tell everybody to do essentially the same thing. We're all going to do this. We're all going to do that. We got a problem. Let's all do this. That, 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 for one thing, that crushes the complexity out of the system because everybody's doing the same thing. But secondly, what if what you decide to do is wrong? Well, it could be a big deal. It could cause big, big problems. Well, but that's not, then that shouldn't be, the, if, if you're thinking about it from an engineering standpoint, that shouldn't be the way to deal with a big system like that. Think about evolution. Evolution doesn't do that. Anytime you get something, well, no, there's no top down from an evolution standpoint, but there's large external events like meteoroids striking Earth. That sort of wrecks the system too, but you can wreck it internally like by doing something like top down. That's no guarantee you won't wreck it in some other way, but at least if you start and do things on a small scale and allow lots of different experiments on a small scale, you can learn from those and if, so, if they don't work, they don't work in that local region. They don't affect the entire system. But I got to admit that right now, people don't seem to want to think like that. And they don't want to think like that. I could, I'll, I'll use one example, fairly simple, from COVID. In the United States, the CDC decided that it was going to develop the first COVID test for use in the United States. And it, by law, forced everybody else not to do anything. It didn't allow any efforts by any organizations or anybody to develop a COVID test. So when the CDC finally brought their test out, it wasn't any good. It, was, it didn't work, didn't work well at all. And so we were already way behind. The United States was hugely behind other countries for COVID testing. And then eventually CDC got the second one right. But by then we were way behind. Really, they should have allowed, they should have worked on their own and allowed others to work on it as well. And yeah, some of them wouldn't work, but what would it be worse than theirs not working the first time? That's top down. Yes, and and I think- Once again, I'm not sure I answered your question. No, 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 I think that's exactly, that's exactly it. And um, yeah, we are very interested in complexity and complex systems here at Cranfield as well. And, uh, um, and of course, we would completely agree that uh, trying to go with the uh, preconceived solution that is imposed from the top on the entire system precludes the, well, it makes the system brittle, right? And it precludes the system from evolution and, and resilience and adaptation. Well, there's a quote from somebody, some, I don't know who, it's been a while. Uh, if you know statistics, correlation between parts in your system, the, the phrase is correlation lengths increase before a phase transition. That means that you'll start to see groups farther and farther away doing the same thing as groups, as, as other groups. And something's going to happen. You're going to get some sort of, in that mm. case, they're talking about a phase transition, but that could be some sort of transition in your system. 
Well, top down guarantees that correlation lengths are extremely long. They cover the entire system. So um, that's part of the reason it doesn't work. If everybody's doing the same thing, something's going to happen. It may be good. It may be bad. If it's bad, it's really bad. A pragmatic question. We've used the word pragmatism a few times, Bill, but another one. Um, imagine educators watching this session uh, and, and are as inspired as I am to understand more about engineering and en engineering way of thinking. What tips, how do they ease themselves into thinking about the engineering way of thinking? Good question, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. If you don't have any engineers to work with, I have to admit it might be difficult to find any who'd be willing to help you anyway, because um, engineers are sort of like that. Uh, I would say read a few things. Pick something by Petrosky. Even go back as far as his 1980 book to 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 engineer as human. Um, and and start with something like that or something and that's something that's more difficult to be Walter Vincenti's book, What Engineers Know and How They Know It. It was recommended to me by a social scientist, but he was an aeronautical Vincenti was an aeronautical engineer. It 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 does a very good job of describing this, including variation and selection as a, as a way that engineering advances and why, for instance, thermodynamics taught to engineers is not the same as thermodynamics taught to physicists. So if you could get through a couple of those or use those as a textbook in a class or, or readings from those in a class, that would get you started. I don't know any I, I don't like I say I've never tried to do this, um, but somehow you have to delve into engineering. And most people, when they think that, get a little worried that they're going to have to do mathematics. And to a certain extent, you might have to. But I think you can do a lot of a lot of good thinking about engineering without doing mathematics much harder than addition and subtraction and division and multiplication. I don't think you got to get more complicated than that. So. Uh, People are just going to have to start trying things, I think, experimenting, because right now I'm not sure there's anything out there. I know the U.S. Military Academy at West Point required everybody there to take three semester course in engineering. I don't know what it was, and I'm not sure they still do it. Ooh. But you got to start somewhere. And the trouble is you can't do what I suggested before and build a base camp because you're not going to get deep disciplinary study. Mm -hmm. So uh, my best thought is to read some of the uh, the the, the non-mathematical literature that's out there on engineering, and there's a reasonable amount of it. I'm going to try that. You've talked a little bit about uh, the resistance that you've encountered from your colleagues initially when you introduced these ideas, even to even to your colleagues in engineering. Um, what's your view about how? how this landscape has developed over time. Do you think there is more acceptance uh, of these ideas now? Do you think it's getting more, um, uh, well, more accepted? Or do you think there's, do you think this is still um, a difficult fight to fight? Or how is it, what have, you, what have you seen over the past couple of decades in this space? Um, much change. Hmm. When I put the ideas out to engineers, engineering way of thinking ideas. And usually when I do that, I start with uh, basic engineering ideas and then a little history on what I, what I think the history of engineering looks like. And then the ideas, it's, it's widely accepted and people really like it. I've presented to Structural Engineers Association in Chicago and <clears throat> presented some other places about it, but it doesn't get very far. And if I try to point out that these ideas can be used in <clears throat> non-technological systems, engineers dismiss it and the general public dismisses it. Most people dismiss it because they think it can't happen. It'll never happen. And they could be right about that. But if we had a broad, uh, some way to educate people more broadly to think about complex systems and, and begin to realize you can't control them. I mean, you can control them, but it's got to be sort of pushing on it gently here and there with, in a lot of different ways, much like evolution works. But think about that. In the United States, there are plenty of people who 
don't think that humans evolved from, from chimpanzees and lower species. So how are you going to convince people? As a matter of fact, a member of our committee doesn't believe it. And he wants me to leave that word out, evolution. But evolution doesn't necessarily always mean biological evolution. Mm. Systems evolve in many ways. And so I, I, I'm, I'm not discouraged, but it, it's a struggle whether you bring it up to non-engineers or engineers. Once you step outside the realm of not once you step outside the realm of technological systems, you know, you get a lot of pushback and it takes a while. I didn't convince my colleagues very readily that it made sense. It took quite a while. As a matter of fact, I had gotten some pretty heated arguments about from one of them who was worried about climate change and didn't think that this idea would, would be a smart way to go. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I didn't agree with him and he eventually at least came around to agreeing that maybe it's possible, but not likely to happen. You sound like you're struggling there, uh, which is a fantastic struggle. What, what's your current thinking? Where are you taking your thinking at the moment? Well, I had been thinking of writing a book to try to pull all this together for uh, essentially everybody, but including non-engineers. And I haven't gotten very far just because I sort of feel like it's a struggle to get people to be willing to think about it. I'm in a book group with a bunch of other faculty members, none of them engineers. And it's come up a little bit, but it's generally, they're unwilling to talk about it, unwilling to discuss it much. It eventually just gets, that'll never happen. And so maybe it'll never happen because everybody thinks it'll never hmm. happen. And I don't really know where we go from here. I, whoever I talk to about it finds it interesting and, and, and will agree until I step away from technological systems. Right. And then suddenly it can't work. That's not what engineering is about. Engineering is about technological systems. And so I really, I'm just sort of, biding my time at this point, doing things like giving this uh, le this interview. It's another way maybe I'm going to get some of this stuff out there now and this giving why, seminars. And places this is why I think this is so important because you're onto something, which is like a pressure point. We're, we're reacting. And I think that is such an important thing. It's inspiring. And maybe it's a question well, of... That's yeah. nice to hear. I got to admit, but... Now, I was going to say, maybe it's a question of uh, reframing this... Uh, in a way that makes it automatic, in the in the way that makes it resonate with other audiences as well. Uh, well, <clears throat> I have given uh, presentations at social science conferences. I gave one not too long ago, <clears throat> and I've pretty much convinced a couple of historians of science that I've that I'm working in the right direction. And usually, there's people who are at those who uh, well since it was done Zoom, Zoom-ish, if you will, um, they could chat with me and I get a lot of, I don't get much pushback. I either get ignored or people are excited by it. Mm. I'd say most people either, most people ignore it or they're interested in it, but it's like, eh, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> so I'm just, right now, my goal is just to keep the ideas out there. I'm retired, but I'm still on the, uh, ASC Engineering Philosophy Committee, and we're still we're working on another paper. You may you I believe you all read one of the one paper we've written. Ooh. So the committee's done a lot of this, but my stuff, this engineering way of thinking, is they mostly are in agreement with it, but they're not they're not pushing it any they're not pushing it. And what inspires you at the moment? What uh, what are you reading at the moment? What books are on your desk? <clears throat> well. I'm an ultra runner, or I was an ultra runner. That means oh, okay. I did races longer than a marathon. And I'm thinking of doing, if I could possibly do it, my first hundred mile race. What? So I'm reading books on ultra running to keep myself inspired to train when there's still two feet of snow on the ground. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oddly enough, well, let's see what else. I, I read 
do I admit to right now? Because I read pretty <laughs> weird stuff sometimes. Don't necessarily agree with it. Matter of fact, I may completely disagree with it, but it's always interesting. So I have a book sitting on my desk now on UFOs. And don't ask me if I believe in UFOs. I don't even know what that means. I simply, there's something out there. Some people are, <laughs> people are behaving strangely. The question is why? And then uh, I have another book on there referred to it called The Future of the Body, which is about, which is about how humans might be able to expand their abilities. And then what else is on the list? I usually have four or five going at once. So do I. I just wrote a book yeah. by, oh, by, by uh, Tim Harford, who wrote a book called Adapt, yes. which I use in my papers. He also wrote one called Messy, <clears throat> and it's about how solutions to um, complex problems are typically messy. They're, it's The best solutions are messy. If you try to take the messiness out, you don't get good solutions. So it's very similar to the ideas he put forward in Adapt. <clears throat> And I think that's about it. Oh, no, I've got another book on that I'm reading literature by uh, Richard Powers, Richard Price, Richard Powers. I can't remember, but the name, the, it's called The Gold Bug Variations. It's about, <clears throat> it's either Richard Price, I think it's Richard Price, Gold Bug Variations. It's a, it's a novel, but it's about... <clears throat> about things you might, the gold bug from Edgar Allan Poe. And so it's about cryptography and it's about music, the Goldberg variations from Bach. So it's long and slow reading, but it's enjoyable. <laughs> okay, I think that about covers that. And now I've admitted to reading about UFOs, so I'm in big <laughs> trouble. <laughs> anyway. Well, Bill, this was a fascinating conversation and thank you so much for your time and, and your insights. And Toby and I enjoyed it thoroughly and I can only hope that you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Like I said, it's always, a fun, always fun to try to get these ideas out. So thanks a lot. Yeah, well, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Inspiring. Thank you.